My name is Greg Rattray. I'm a senior research professor at Columbia's School of International and Public Affairs. Uh, and the event is the first forum for this newly formed group. Uh, the US-Japan Digital and Cyber Dialogue was initiated in late March. Um, the participants are a range of leaders and thinkers from policy, business, and academe. Uh, uh, interested in ensuring that the communities in the US and Japan uh, understand each other's perspectives and identify key issues for collaboration uh, between the two, uh, the two nations. Um, we arranged tonight's event uh, actually even before we got into the current COVID situation and we kicked off again in late, late March uh, through this. So uh, I, we hope everybody will bear with us as we uh, try to bring together this first uh, you know, larger forum for the, the participants in the dialogue and the interested parties. I, I will note, uh, as the team knows, that I myself, I got knocked off of Wi-Fi, and so I'm using my iPhone and its uh, Zoom capabilities. So uh, we have a backup plan uh, to that, but I think uh, we've learned in this situation that uh, flexibility is crucial, and we've also uh, learned to use a wide range of new tools. Um, in terms of the agenda, we're honored to have Under Secretary General Nakamitsu Izumi, uh, who is the Undersecretary for Disarmament and a leader in the issue of uh, cyber norms and the challenges that fake, uh, face us, um, kick us off tonight with a keynote address. And uh, you, uh, she will also take questions. Um, I will do my best to monitor the chat room. And uh, if you have questions, our procedure tonight will be to use the Zoom chat. Um, I will get to the fact that we've got two uh, channels going uh, at the same time in a moment. Following the keynote address, we're going to have four panels that are identified uh, on the agenda and hopefully most of the, the people on both channels have seen the agenda in advance. These are the four areas that the participants in the dialogue have identified as key areas for discussion and collaboration. So we set up uh, 30 minute panels, which will go one after another for the two hours after the keynote address uh, on these four subjects. Uh, we will attempt to take a uh, break for just uh, five minutes uh, between panels two and three, but this is dependent on us uh, staying on time and we're gonna uh, strive to do our best uh, to keep the, all the sessions on schedule since the panels are relatively short and you know, we wanna make sure that everybody has a, an opportunity to, to get the panel through the panels and all the participants, you know, all, the, all the topics get discussed uh, sufficiently. I guess uh, a few notes on uh, the nature of uh, the session and disclosure. Um, the session is non-public and it is being recorded. Cherry, you've started the recording? Yes. Um, where the way we plan to use the recording is the, the video of the keynote address will be made available uh, to dial, will be made, made available through KO, Columbia, and the Japan Society uh, to their membership or interested parties as, as see fit. It won't be posted on YouTube for public consumption. Um, the overall video will be used by those uh, participants in the, in the dialogue as we uh, continue our work forward. And the Japan Society uh, has asked and uh, we've agreed that the panel three will be uh, made available to the members of the Japan Society as the Japan Society uh, chooses. Um, I think the right, the time is now uh, sort of to turn to introductions by each of the organization's sponsors uh, to tonight's event. Uh, the, the order of, um, of introductions will be uh, Professor June Marai, uh, Joshua Walker from the uh, Japan Society and Dean Merritt Janow from Columbia's uh, School of International and Public Affairs. So uh, I'm about to turn it over to Professor uh, Marai, uh, of Keio University, who is the co-director of the Cyber Civilization Research Center. I think many, many on the phone probably understand 
Neptune's sort of essential role in the development of the internet in uh, Japan, as well as the crucial role he has played as an advisor uh, to commercial and uh, government policy uh, over more than, a, more than two, probably three decades, not to date you, June. <laughs> uh, the essential role he's played uh, in this area for Japan. So with that, uh, over to you, Professor Mirai. Okay, yeah, th thank you very much, Greg. Um, and uh, thank you very much for the other participants to uh, participating on this uh, a very important uh, event, uh, you know, uh, between the uh, Colombia Cyber and the uh, uh, KEO CCLC uh, for the discussion of the kind of a new uh, dimensions of uh, uh, cyberspace. So, uh, you know, I remember the 20, 20 years ago, uh, the, you know, I've been developing the internet as an internet community, uh, especially, you know, working mostly with the, you know, US colleagues of mine in the, uh, Europe and the Japan is uh, one of the kind of a uh, three regional uh, developers of the internet. Uh, and uh, then you know, the, when the year 2000 comes, so uh, that was uh, 20 years ago, uh, it was a Y2K, right, and time. And then uh, we were, uh, you know, very much a collaboratively uh, for the kind of uh, expected uh, failure and the risk uh, on the Y2K. That was a very, very first time after the you know, kind of uh, 15 years of uh, development of the internet, and then you know, the entire society noticed that uh, you know, what's the impact of the internet then? You know, what's the impact of the cyberspace? Uh, very much uh, seriously on that uh, occasion. So Y2K fortunately doesn't happen anything, but uh, you know, the important thing is that uh, you know, the entire society noticed that uh, what's the meaning of the cyberspace to the you know, rest of the engineering, technical, scientific community. And so uh, then they suddenly noticed that, uh, oh, it's already on an uh, infrastructure that uh, everybody's living, and especially in the United States and Japan. And uh, so uh, those uh, uh, internet advanced uh, nation states, mm -hmm. and it was, it was a serious issue. And then the next year we have a 9-11. And I was in charge of uh, operation of the internet from the point of view of uh, a chair of the root named server operator. And then I was asked by the many of the nation, especially from the US government, that uh, uh, what's gonna be happening if, uh, you know, kind of uh, fragmenting, isolating the United States out from the internet and that can the uh, rest of the world can survive? And that was a question that then in my answer basically was that, that no, 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 it's a very, very fatal to the US economy as well. It, you know, that's the most important thing. And then, then again, this type of experience that's happening in a 20 years ago is gonna let us that, uh, you know, this is the infrastructure uh, we're gonna be living and that then any part of the segment and that this uh, becomes a very serious one uh, after 20 years. And then uh, we now have a, a pandemic situation where the people are not, people are actually uh, fragmented from the move, uh, uh, you know, physical move. And then the, we, we have an uh, internet. So, uh, you know, after the internet, we have this pandemic. And uh, therefore, the, it's a very, very, very uh, important time that uh, we're going to you know, this historical moment that we are facing all of us and then they know uh, for the working together for the future uh, because uh, we, are ex we are, you know, the assumption is uh, we do have a cyberspace and then in what's a complicated the future uh, in front of us gonna be, uh, you know, uh, created right, as a society. So. Uh, I think that's a very good members and a good, very good combination uh, of the institutes to uh, host them. And uh, so uh, I'd like to thank, uh, you know, uh, the Columbia University sidebar uh, uh, and the uh, Japan Society uh, for, uh, you know, kind of co-organizing uh, this uh, very, very important and I, I think it's a historical event. Thank you very much. Thank you. 
thank you very much. Um, I'm Merit Jano, Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University. And it really is, uh, I'm very pleased to have this opportunity uh, to participate uh, in this uh, dialogue and uh, this important collaboration uh, between uh, Colombia, Keio, and Japan society. Uh, you know, I think the U.S. has very few countries uh, that it really has uh, as close a relationship with as it has with Japan. And this spans, you know, many, many dimensions. Uh, but expanding our networks and our cooperation is incredibly important in today's complex world. And it seems to me that the crucial dimensions of consultation and cooperation today uh, revolve around or include data and security. And this conference, this dialogue brings those elements uh, together and in doing so implicates trade, innovation, geopolitics, and both domestic and international institutions. So it does seem to me, as Professor uh, Mirai was saying, that deepening cooperation um, around the digital economy, around cybersecurity, um, as we'll discuss today, involves, uh, requires trust, and trust is born out of shared frameworks and approaches. I don't think we need identical approaches, but we need sufficiently comparable or sympathetic approaches uh, to build that trust, uh, to build resilience, and to build uh, frictionless exchanges. And that's part uh, of the role of institutions, too, to support that uh, cooperative framework development. So we'll have a wonderful opportunity to cover these issues and others. We owe a special debt uh, to our senior research scholar, Greg Raptree, for pulling this dialogue together. Greg comes to this with extensive experience as a senior cybersecurity expert and executive in finance, consulting, government, and the services. So thank you, Greg, for your leadership. And I'm very pleased to collaborate with uh, Keo, uh, uh, Professor Murai, a true leader uh, as well as Joshua Walker, an uh, expert in Japan and international relations and our terrific new president of Japan Society, I say with pride, having served on the board uh, for a number of years. At Columbia and SIPA, I inaugurated a program some seven years ago on technology and policy when I became dean, believing that it was really important that uh, we look at the global dimensions of uh, cybersecurity, internet go uh, governance, and the digital economy. And we've launched a number of forums, uh, which we call the Digital Futures Forums. Um, some are big or some are small, um, open, uh, semi-open. And a couple of years ago, we were very pleased that the Nijilo rodents uh, have uh, undertaken to support this effort and allow it to go on. And today is very much in that tradition with this crucial focus on the United States and Japan. I think we can accomplish a lot together, the United States uh, and Japan. So today I'm looking forward to a productive dialogue that supports this really important purpose. I'm very grateful for the participants we have with us, outstanding experts um, from the United States, Japan, the business community, policy community, academic community, and more. So thank you all very, very much. Great. Well, I'll jump in. Thank you, uh, Merit, uh, Dean Janow. Uh, it's kind of hard to follow your boss, uh, given that she's on the board. And I see other bosses online here from the board of directors from Toby Meyerson uh, and others. Uh, we at the Japan Sai are really excited to be here. Originally, when we had this conversation, we thought we might be having it physically. Uh, but obviously, uh, COVID and, and the situation here in New York and globally has not made that possible. It actually is even more um, appropriate in this moment that the US and Japan come together to talk about these issues. I'm particularly excited uh, to hear from all the experts here. Uh, I'm excited to see so many familiar, familiar faces. It gives me great 
hope at Japan Society as we look towards the future uh, to engage in conversations like this and to partner with such world-class institutions such as Keio and Columbia. So I will simply uh, add my uh, konbanwa from New York and ohayou gozaimasu to all of you in Tokyo. And without further ado, turn it back so we can have a great conversation today. But we're excited to be a part of this and we look forward to connecting with all of you through Japan Society. Thank you. Thank you, Joshua, and uh, the other uh, you know, sponsors. I think we're gonna turn directly to the Under Secretary General for Disarmament Affairs, uh, Ms. Uh, Nakamitsu Izumi, and uh, have her provi provide us a keynote address. Uh, we uh, established the topic as establishing global cyber norms, implications for the Japan and the United States, but uh, she will likely uh, take that topic in, in, in directions that will educate us all. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greg. I'm not sure if I will be educational to you. Rather, I will be learning from you. Uh, Professor Murai, uh, Dr. Walker, De Jane Genoi, Dean Genoi, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much for this opportunity to speak today. Um, I would like to obviously express my appreciation to Keio University, Columbia University, and the Japan Society for organizing this event. Um, obviously, this is a very timely uh, uh, event. Um, first of all, I really hope that all of you and your loved ones are in good health and good spirits under these very difficult circumstances. So today, um, please allow me to share a few thoughts on the work being done uh, in the United Nations to address cyber threats, uh, provide an overview of the UN's uh, intergovernmental processes, um, and highlight the important role of all stakeholders in our common efforts to secure the cyber environment. Uh, but before I do so, uh, I would like to briefly touch on what is naturally on all of our minds, which is the current pandemic and its implications on cybersecurity. Since the um, uh, event of the um, COVID-19 pandemic, the rapid large scale adoption of digital technologies is really transforming um, how we do business and has prom uh, promoted innovative new ways to collaborate online. I feel as if I'm living now in a virtual world uh, from email to text to email um, and um, online discussions, uh, one from, from the next. And, and by the way, this is the third, only the third, I would say, uh, online event I am participating today. Earlier uh, today, I heard Chris Painter saying that this is in fact the seventh, so I'm not anywhere near your activism. Uh, previously, we already relied heavily on ICTs. But the current pandemic has really greatly exacerbated this dependency. It has also expanded the attack surface, which can be exploited by malicious uh, actors, unfortunately. Indeed, our increasing use of ICTs during the crisis is being accompanied by an enormous spike in cyber incidents. Reports indicate that uh, sphere um, uh, phishing attacks have right risen 667% between February and April this year. Furthermore, over 300,000 suspicious COVID-19 related websites have been created between January and March of this year. Even more worrisome have been the mounting malware campaigns against hospitals, medical research facilities, and other critical institutions over the past few months. The World Health Organization, for example, reported experiencing more than five times the number of cyber attacks uh, than in the same period last year. These incidents are compounding people's already widespread sense of insecurity around their health, livelihood, and future. The United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, has drawn attention to cyber attacks on health facilities during the COVID-19 pandemic. He called on the international community to prevent and end such attacks on critical infrastructures, which can indeed cause severe harms to civilians. In a sense, I am glad that 
the challenges facing us also give further impetus to multilateral efforts and international cooperation to ensure that people can enjoy the benefits of trustworthy and secure digital space, especially now that is most needed. Ladies and gentlemen, turning to the work of the United Nations, well, before the current crisis, Secretary General Guterres has already stressed that in cyberspace, we collectively face uh, um, trying to um, risks of digital divide, a social divide, and also a, a political divide. This is why he has made cybersecurity a priority. He established an independent high-level panel on digital cooperation, uh, co-chaired by Melinda Gates and Jack, Jack Ma. The panel's report contains proposals on how to harness key opportunities and to address the challenges facing us in the digital sphere. A roadmap for the implementation of these recommendations will be released very soon uh, in June. Furthermore, the Secretary General prioritized UN efforts to promote the peaceful use of ICTs, particularly in the context of international security. In his agenda for disarmament, he made a commitment to work with member states to foster a culture of accountability and adherence to emerging norms, rules, and principles on responsible behavior in cyberspace. Because I must say very unfortunately, such a culture is not a given at the moment. A number of states are developing ICT capabilities, which can be used to carry out malicious acts. Beyond COVID-19 related attacks, other cyber attacks by state and st non-state actors against ICT dependent infrastructure continue to be a major concern. Critical infrastructure such as electric grids, and financial systems have been targeted in such attacks. Um, and the WannaCry ran, uh, ransomware of 2017 affected computer systems across 150 countries, uh, compromising equipments and care for patients in hospital, as we all know. Although no loss of life has been reported as yet as directly resulting from a cyber attack, such incidents bring with them a risk of misperception, miscalculation, and ultimately uh, an intended escalation of tension between states. Now, ladies and gentlemen, key efforts have also been made on cybersecurity under United Nations processes. As you are no doubt all aware, five groups of governmental experts, or GGE, have been established since 2004. These groups have reached success in agreeing that international law, in particular the United Nations Charter, applies to the use of ICTs. They have also recommended practical confidence building and capacity building measures for fostering peace and security uh, and peace and stability in uh, digital sphere. The uh, 2015 group was able to recommend 11 voluntary non-binding norms of responsible state behavior in the use of ICTs, which were accepted by all UN member states in the General Assembly. The General Assembly adopted a resolution calling on all states to be guided in their use of ICTs by this 2015 group's report. This gives uh, the global community an agreed normative framework, if you will, or a quiz from which to promote stability in cyberspace. Now in 2018, two new groups have been established under the United Nations. A new group of governmental experts comprised of 25 individuals working in their personal capacity and an open-ended working group open to all UN member states to build upon this uh, framework. The 2015 norm and other measures are um, universally accepted and must not be rolled back in the new processes. But as, um, as more uh, countries join in the conversation, 
room must be made for their needs and priorities which in, in the fast-paced digital realm may not be the same as five years ago uh, when the 11 norms were uh, endorsed. The expert process also foresaw that new norms may need to be developed over time. I hope that they will be space in the discussions under the open-ended working group in particular for states to agree to further elaborate existing norms. Ladies and gentlemen, the United Nations member states and Secretary General are committing to promote a culture of accountability and adherence to emerging norms, rules, and principles on responsible behavior in cyberspace. But we cannot do it alone. While states carry primary responsibility for maintaining international security, ICTs are an integral part of our societies and other stakeholders have a key role and interest, as well as responsibility in securing cyberspace. Perspectives from the private sector, civil society and academia are needed to contribute a unique and important part of the collective solution to cybersecurity that the international community is indeed seeking. Last year, the open-ended working group held a historic, I would say, meeting with all stakeholders to consider cyber issues in the context of peace and security. More than 100 stakeholders from the private sector, civil society and academia joined over 114 uh, states in a rich discussion that received very positive feedback. The uh, expert process uh, on its part has held consultations with regional organizations as well as their uh, wide um, membership. These meetings have also been very well received by the overall member states of the United Nations. So allow me to end my remarks by returning to the issue of the COVID-19 pandemic, this time to highlight that there are key um, analogies between the health pandemic and also the, um, the threats that we face in the digital world. First, both these threats are not easily seen with a naked eye. With COVID-19, as we now know, they are not always visible symptoms of the disease. Likewise, in an ICT incident, you may not be able to tell if malicious activities is happening in your network. Secondly, COVID-19 and digital threats both present us with challenges that have no borders. One country's capacity and decision to act impacts those of other countries around the world. Finally, and above all, if there is one takeaway from the current COVID-19 crisis, it is that more than ever, we need to take concerted, coordinated, multi-stakeholder action. We can only beat the pandemic and we can only effectively address the threats facing us from the ICT environment if we do so collectively by sharing information, providing mutual assistance and raising each other's capacities. So I encourage all stakeholders from private sector, civil society and academia to rise up to the challenge to work together with states to address global digital challenges so that we can all take forward the goal of an open, secure, accessible, and peaceful ICT environment. Thank you very much. Okay, can uh, everybody hear me? Cherry, do you have me up on the screen at the moment? Um, yes. I uh, just quickly, a uh, couple matters of procedure. We're starting to see people put questions into the chat room. I'm also monitoring time. So what I'm going to do is Admiral Blair actually has a question. If you could put the undersecretary back up, I will go to the chat and, uh, and ask the question. I think we're just going to take one question on, uh, related to the keynote, and then we're going to transition to the panel 
the first panel because the undersecretary has graciously agreed to join us in the first panel, which is again, a uh, continued discussion on cyber norms, but in a more uh, direct context of how the US and Japan can collaborate. So Cherry, if you would, could you please uh, put the undersecretary uh, back up on the screen and I will uh, read uh, Admiral Blair's question. Okay. So the question is, uh, you know, we read about differences in approach to many cyber issues between China, Russia, on the one hand, and the US, Japan, and many democratic European countries on the other. How are these playing out in the UN efforts to achieve agreed norms? Thank you for that question. This is exactly uh, where we are in the, at the intergovernmental processes. Now, the differences are, um, well, first of all, the common ground is that um, they have all agreed, as I briefed already in my remarks, that um, international law applies in cyberspace, international law in particular, UN Charter. Um, what they are still grappling with is exactly how international law applies. Uh, the sensitivities uh, related to this, and, and this is just a, a factual statement. Um, for example, um, the um, international humanitarian law applicable in the cyberspace, there are differences of views. Um, how exactly the um, uh, Article 51 of the UN chapter applies, this is the, um, the article related to uh, self-defense. Uh, how, how would these uh, um, provisions exactly apply in cyberspace? Those are um, the contentious issues, uh, which uh, in, in, um, in the two intergovernmental processes, the, uh, the group of governmental experts and open-ended working group, member states are still discussing and deliberating on. Um, this said, um, I think there are um, uh, uh, some, um, oh, uh, another, I'm sorry, I, I forgot to, to point out one additional uh, differences of view. Um, there is a view that existing uh, international law is sufficient to address the issues related to cyber. Uh, and another view is that the cyber, you know, in order to govern cyberspace, uh, they should be a new um, internationally and uh, international and legally binding instruments to be negotiated and, and agreed upon. Uh, that's another uh, differences of view um, as to exactly how international law should uh, apply in cyberspace. Um, I think um, this is exactly why we need to have um, the, the intergovernmental processes that we have at the moment. Um, one positive uh, uh, um, element coming from those two processes is that uh, there seem to be a lot of agreements uh, that in order for us to also further develop norms in general, they will have to be um, some more uh, concrete measures related to confidence building um, in cyberspace, as well as capacity building in cyberspace. Um, not all UN member states uh, have uh, the, the, exactly the same level of understanding and also capacities for cybersecurity as well. Um, I think uh, um, uh, ITU report, Inter International Telecommunications Union report, um, says that uh, it's, it's only about, uh, it's, it's about 90 countries still at the very early stage of cyber taking cybersecurity. Um, in terms of their own capacities at the national level. So um, we are now in the process at the multilateral level uh, in order for us to collectively move towards a stronger norms in cyberspace. We need to increase the capacities in those areas. We need to also have more innovative ideas for how to uh, create uh, confidence in, in cyberspace. All these things actually adds up to uh, what we will be discussing what, what I have already mentioned, which is a trust uh, environment in, in the cyberspace. 